One of the hardest types of character to write is a psychopath, yet they're also one of the most common types of villains you'll run across. It's very easy to write a bad psychopath just so that you can have your bad guy do whatever bad shit he has to do for the story to progress. Let's play the one where they have to kill each other! Last one standing wins! I know it's your favorite, but last time we did that, you killed the winner anyway. Oh. But it's not compelling or interesting. Evil guy is evil because he doesn't feel empathy, he's extremely overdone and actually sort of insulting when you consider that there are real life people out there who have to live with this mental condition. The term psychopath is nearly synonymous with serial killer in modern culture, but there are millions of people out there actually living with this mental illness, trying to live normal lives despite it. About 1.2% of Americans meet the clinical criteria to be diagnosed as psychopaths. This doesn't mean that you can't have your bad guy be a psychopath, but it does mean that lazy, one-dimensional psychopath characters are not only uninteresting, but frankly pretty insulting and a massively missed opportunity. I made a video not long ago about a series that essentially makes every single one of its antagonists into the most boring, generic, and incorrect depiction of a psychopath possible. An entitled, childish asshole who likes hurting people just because it's fun. When I make criticisms of characters like this, often the argument I see is that, oh, well there are people like that in real life, which, yes, there are hundreds of billions of people who have ever lived on Earth. You will be able to point to examples of just about any flavor of person you can imagine. Is it realistic? No. But it is technically possible that there are people out there that are this incredibly, unbelievably corrupt. But is it interesting to talk about these people? Is it interesting to have a bad guy who is just bad and there's not any more to it? No. If anything, it's just annoying to everyone reading that you think they're so unintelligent that good guy smash bad guy is enough to entertain them. Then I clapped! I clapped when I saw them too! It broke new ground! So does this mean that every villain has to be the relatable, was once a good guy trope we've seen so much of recently? No. You can write a character who is a bad person who does despicable things for bad reasons. A character does not have to be relatable to be well written. In fact, I prefer well written characters who are unrelatable because they give you an entirely new perspective you likely haven't even considered. When done well, psychopaths are some of my favorite characters in fiction because they're so incredibly unique. They don't need to be relatable or have a tragic backstory that makes you feel bad for them. In fact, the whole reason they're so interesting is because you can't relate to them. They make decisions you would never be ready for, that you would never think of, because they quite literally just think differently. With all that out of the way, I think it's time we start talking about the subject of this video. One of the best examples of a true psychopath I've ever seen, Hyakunosuke Ogata from Golden Kamui. Obvious spoiler warning if you're looking to watch or read it for yourself, but I will try to at least stay focused purely on Ogata's role in the story, so you will hopefully still want to check it out afterwards if you haven't already. In order to talk about Ogata and what separates a good and bad depiction of a psychopath, we need to clear up what a psychopath actually is. Depictions of psychopaths in media have sort of formed a public idea of a psychopath essentially being a typical slasher movie villain. A person who enjoys violence, killing people, and is generally incapable of feeling anything other than rage, bloodlust, or sadistic satisfaction. In reality, psychopathy has no requirement or overt tendency towards enjoying causing harm to others. Another common mistake is the confusion between sociopaths and psychopaths. Sociopathy actually more closely resembles the idea of what a psychopath is like in popular opinion. In fact, most people tend to have them flipped around in their mind. Sociopaths tend to act impulsively and erratically, are prone to fits of rage, tend to be selfish, and want to see themselves as the good guy like the rest of us. You're not the real heroes. I'm the real hero. A true psychopath, however, is calm and calculated, feels little to no emotion whatsoever, and doesn't need to rationalize or justify their actions to anyone, including themselves. Told me that he'd been planning to kill somebody for about as long as he could remember. Said if they turned him out, he'd do it again. Said he knew he was going to hell. Be there in about 15 minutes. Keep in mind here, I'm referring to the true, clinical ideal of a psychopath, not just someone with psychopathic tendencies. The true, ideal psychopath is cold and emotionless, but fakes emotion to better position themselves in society. Not only are they indifferent to whether their actions are right or wrong, they're also generally unaware of the concept. There is no right or wrong, just is and isn't. Things either are, or they aren't. Psychopaths aren't driven by a bloodlust or hatred, but simple self-interest. What would be best for me? Okay, let's do that. Anyone who gets hurt as a result is completely irrelevant. Not because, wah ha ha, I'm the best, fuck the rest. But because why would I care? If they aren't me, their pain is theirs, and I did not feel it. Psychopathy is not a burning flame of malice, it's a cold and hollow machine that serves itself first above all else. Keeping that in mind is very important when we're looking at the actions of Ogata and other examples I'm going to use in this video. We also can't really talk about Ogata without talking about the series he's from. 
Hyakunosuke Ogata is a character from the manga series Golden Kamui, which is a story taking place shortly after the Russo-Japanese War. It's about a veteran of the war teaming up with an Ainu child to find a legendary stash of hidden gold. To do this, they have to collect the tattooed skins of a set of escaped convicts that, when put together, will form a map to the gold. This war veteran is Sachi Sugimoto, known as Sugimoto the Immortal for his unyielding will to live and uncanny ability to survive almost anything. Something that's very interesting about Sugimoto, especially compared to typical manga protagonists, is his decisive willingness to maim, kill, and even torture those in his way to get what he wants. Despite this, Sugimoto is not a psychopath, a sociopath, or even really a bad guy. He's not a shining hero, but ultimately everything Sugimoto does is something you can understand and empathize with. He's a veteran of a terrible war where he saw incredible amounts of death and had to do terrible things to survive. His ability to kill without hesitation is decisively different from Ogata's. When Sugimoto kills, it's usually spur of the moment, done out of either fear, necessity, or rage. Sugimoto kills people almost exclusively to protect himself or others because it's what he's been taught and it's all he knows. The rare times when he isn't protecting anything, he's driven by a sense of morality to punish what he perceives as evil. When Ogata kills someone, it's much more simple. Is this person in my way? Will killing them further my goals? Will it come back to bite me? A simple yes yes no to this three question survey and Ogata will pull the trigger from 100 meters away, go eat lunch and forget you ever even existed. Ogata kills with the same amount of indifference as Hideki Kamiya blocks people on Twitter. Something people sometimes have a hard time understanding about psychopaths is how they're supposed to be given motivation. How are you supposed to motivate someone who doesn't feel emotion? It's a hard thing to explain, but think of it like this. Do you like to eat? Yes? Well you're gonna have to figure out a way to feed yourself. No one else is going to do it, why would they? How do you best feed yourself? Well, it seems society has quite a few jobs, let's get the best one, because the best is better. Now you can feed yourself, but what next? You're doing okay, but you can be doing better, and better is good for you. Let's do what we can to move up. You might be thinking, well that's cheating, that person clearly has emotions because they're wanting things, they clearly feel greed. And technically, yeah, you're right. There's no such thing as feeling absolutely no emotion, because to even want is an emotion. The simple act of having likes and dislikes can be considered an emotion. If you truly felt absolutely no emotion whatsoever, you would not be alive. You would flop over with indifference to the pain of hitting the ground and suffocate to death with the indifference of continuing to live. The instinct to live in and of itself is an emotion. Psychopaths do technically feel emotion, they do have wants and goals, but it's not the same as someone pursuing a passion or someone who just wants it all. Psychopaths are detached from this emotional frame of thinking and instead are coldly logical. Serving their self-interest isn't done out of selfish greed, but simple instincts. I am me, and others are not. It's basic logic to look out for yourself. Everyone's doing it. Sugimoto is clearly a far cry from this kind of thinking. Almost everything he does is for the sake of someone else. He's able to kill and do horrible things so easily because he has already given up on himself and believes he cannot be redeemed. So he may as well help those he considers innocent and punish those he considers evil while he's here. We first meet Ogata in Chapter 4. Sugimoto has captured one of the tattooed prisoners, Kanjiro, and reveals to him a troubling truth. The tattoos they've been given were meant to be skinned. They were designed to be cut and torn from their bodies to be collected, not read while they're alive. He provokes Sugimoto by saying that the previous soldiers who came for the tattoos were practically teenagers and that he should have seen how they died. Sugimoto pulls his pistol out and threatens him before being interrupted by a Sirpa, who says she won't help him if he kills the prisoner. Sugimoto plays it off as an interrogation technique, but honestly it could have gone either way. Asirpa begins drawing the man's tattoos, planning to simply copy the design down so they don't have to skin him, but despite her best attempts to avoid causing any more harm to the man, he's shot in the head by a sniper. This sniper is Hyakunosuke Ogata. Immediately in this very short scene, we are unknowingly shown pretty much everything we need to know about Ogata. We learn his skill set is that of a sniper, that he kills without remorse or hesitation. We learn that he's cold, cunning, and pretty much entirely uninterested in others, though we don't understand how deliberate and extreme this aspect of his personality is yet. In this introduction, you wouldn't be wrong to think Ogata is just a random bad guy sent to foil Sugimoto's plans and provide some quick conflict. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Not just because Ogata survives this encounter and becomes an extremely important antagonist for the series, but because this scene actually shows us perfectly just how different Ogata is. We're shown Sugimoto's dark tendencies and willingness to kill, but it's clearly different from Ogata's cold indifference. Sugimoto gets angry, he makes threats, he kills with a sense of right and wrong. He has respect for his enemy, he doesn't want to kill him, but he understands that he has to. Ogata, on the other hand, fights Sugimoto with complete disinterest. He's willing to let Sugimoto go at first, not out of respect or empathy, but because that's what would be easier for him. The moment Sugimoto eliminates that option, Ogata drops any pretense of camaraderie between soldiers or respect for his combatant. To Sugimoto, Ogata is an enemy. To Ogata, Sugimoto is an obstacle. We also see an obvious difference between Ogata and Kanjiro, who is a normal but morally corrupt person. Kanjiro is shown to be a bad guy, but he still clearly has emotions. 
What he says to Sugimoto isn't just a throwaway line to make sure you know he's evil, it's an attempt to unnerve him, to get under his skin to try to make him lose his cool. Kanjiro doesn't like his current situation, he wants to feel in control, he's angry and upset and is irrationally attacking Sugimoto to try and make himself feel better. Compare that to how Ogata reacts to the defeat by Sugimoto. He seems to feel no shame, no desire to get revenge or best the man who defeated him and broke his arm. He has no problem admitting that he can't win and retreating because it doesn't matter to him. Sneak attacks, eye pokes, running away, it's all on the table. There's no such thing as a good or prideful victory. There's just victory in defeat. You either survive or you don't. Just do whatever you can to serve your best interests. And finally there's Asirpa, who is good natured. Asirpa doesn't want anyone to get killed, even if they are a bad person. She wants to do the right thing and help people even if it might hurt her, essentially the opposite of Ogata. We'll see throughout the series that Ogata is not only entirely willing to take advantage of this kind nature, but that it also annoys him. Because in the mind of Ogata, where everything either is or isn't, someone who behaves strictly on a moral code and constantly makes what is clearly the wrong choice is so frustratingly confusing. I've spoken mostly in broad strokes about Ogata and the story of Golden Kamui so far, but from this point on, it's gonna be basically impossible to explain why Ogata is such a well-written psychopath without, well, telling you what he does in his role in the story. Again, I'll try to focus just on him, but Golden Kamui is a great series you should really read for yourself. Even if you do watch this whole video first, there's such an expansive cast of characters who are all incredibly realized of their own potential that this shouldn't ruin it for you. Ogata is beaten by Sugimoto and tries to escape. Sugimoto throws his rifle at him, knocking him out and causing him to slip into a freezing cold river. They assume him dead and Sugimoto declares it a good thing, because otherwise he would have alerted the rest of his unit. Again, the clear difference here. Sugimoto is justifying the death of Ogata because it will keep him safe. Ogata needs no justification for killing Kanjiro, it was just in his best interests. Obviously, Ogata does not actually die in the frozen lake, otherwise I wouldn't be making this video. He's found by his unit, the 7th Division, and is able to recover from his wounds. We don't see him again for almost 40 chapters, where he shows up in an Ainu village to question another member of his unit, Tanagaki, about why he hasn't responded back to their lieutenant. There's an obviously threatening aura to his interrogation, and he reveals that he preemptively removed the bolt from Tanagaki's gun. We're shown that Ogata is not just a marksman sniper, but is clever in putting himself in a position of power. Not only did he make sure Tanagaki would not be armed for this interrogation, but he positioned himself near people he cared about so that he wouldn't even think about trying anything. We also see how easily Ogata is able to fake emotions, flipping between jovial and malice on a whim, depending on what will better suit the situation. But still, at this point, Ogata can very easily seem like just a standard soldier following orders, albeit a clever one with some acting skills. He leaves Tanagaki after getting all the information he can, and then attempts to snipe him from a distance after leaving. Mikaido asks why he didn't just kill him in the hut, and Ogata gives two excuses, one fake and one real. He says that if they had done it in the hut, they'd have to kill the witnesses too, and that he wouldn't want to kill the old woman because he was fond of his grandmother growing up. This is clearly just an excuse to make himself seem more sympathetic. As we learn later on, Ogata was not all that close to his grandmother at all, and he very clearly has no qualms about killing anyone from children to the elderly. What is true, however, is that they would have had to kill the witnesses, and the rest of the village wouldn't take too kindly to that. Ogata has taken the bolt to Tanagaki's weapon, so the best way for him to handle this situation is to believe in his skills as a sniper and kill Tanagaki from a distance. What's important here isn't really the details of the battle, but Ogata's interactions with Nikaido. Nikaido is another soldier in the 7th Division, who is motivated almost entirely by hatred for Sugimoto, and in this hunt for Tanagaki, we get to see an excellent contrast between Ogata's psychopathy and Akaido's blind lust for revenge. They're both enemies to Sugimoto, and both have been defeated by him, but they react very differently. Nikaido is consumed by a hatred for Sugimoto and is obsessed with killing him as horribly as possible, while Ogata simply saw his defeat as a learning experience and how to deal with Sugimoto in the future. Nikaido continually makes rash decisions and puts his current comfort over the objective. He gets angry and he just wants to hurry up and kill Tanagaki already, while Ogata thinks out the situation logically and keeps his cool. And Ogata uses this, making Nikaido do anything he believes will be dangerous, knowing that he's too hot-headed and frustrated to go against it. Despite the fact that they are both remorseless killers, comrades with the same goal, Ogata is completely willing to let Nikaido die if it will make things easier for him. We see this in full effect when Tanagaki's trap works as intended and a brown bear begins to maul Nikaido. The plan was to lure Nikaido out so the bear would attack him, forcing Ogata to fire and reveal his position. But Ogata doesn't shoot, even while Nikaido begs for help. The plan backfires. Almost, at least. Ogata does eventually shoot, for one simple reason. Nikaido is of more use to him alive than dead, and Tanagaki has no gun to return fire with. Or at least Ogata thought. 
Unfortunately, Tanagaki had another rifle, gifted to him by a chance encounter with one of the tattooed convicts. This is where we see that while Ogata is cold and calculating, he's not infallible. And more importantly, under that completely emotionless exterior, there is one thing he cares about. One emotion he places importance in. Pride. If you remember back to Ogata's fight with Sugimoto, you'll remember Ogata had no issue using cheap shots, running with his tail between his legs, and accepting defeat. So why is it here that this cold, emotionless man went for such an egotistical play? Well, one side of it is simple error, the mistake of believing Tanagaki was completely unarmed, and not accounting for the possibility of a second gun hidden away somewhere. The other part of it is pride. Ogata feels little to no emotion, but one emotion he does feel is pride. Pride in his abilities as a cunning, methodical sniper. He doesn't care if Sugimoto beats his ass in hand-to-hand -hand combat, because that's not his skill set. But when Tanagaki is brazen enough to challenge his planning, his strengths as a sniper, Ogata's ego awakens and he has to prove just how on top he is. This is another common trait among psychopaths, egocentricity. Psychopathy is a disorder that tends to wipe away all concern for anything but the self, but there still is a sense of self. Even without morality, there is a pride in what and who you are, and what Ogata is, is a tactical marksman. So when Tanagaki challenges him on both of these aspects, he needs to defend that sense of self. Tanagaki's shot luckily hits Ogata's binoculars, saving his life, and Ogata gets right back to killing. He's come down from his moment of weakness and is back to sound thinking. Now that he realizes there is danger, he abandons Nikaido without a second thought. Lieutenant Surumi's men show up and give chase to Ogata, who wounds most of them non-fatally as a sniper tactic since soldiers will fall back to help the wounded but not the dead. This tactic and his role as a sniper complement his personality so perfectly. Ogata will kill without hesitation, but the kill itself is not the goal, it just happens to align with his goal. If shooting you in the head will solve the problem, he will shoot you in the head. If shooting you in the leg is what will help him most, he'll shoot you in the leg. He uses other people's sense of empathy against them to further his own goals, supporting the idea that his way of thinking is superior because he's not held back like they are. One of the most interesting things about Golden Kamui is that it's very hard to keep track of who the antagonists are. Sugimoto and the Sirpa remain the clear protagonists throughout this whole story, but the people traveling with them change so often and so drastically that you can sometimes forget what side everyone's on. Enemies become friends become enemies become friends, and it allows for an interesting dynamic where you can see how the protagonists and antagonists interact with each other in simple day-to-day -day tasks. And to me, there's none more interesting than Ogata's. Golden Kamui is equally as comedic as it is dark. While traveling with the main characters, Ogata is usually used for the comedic effect of his complete indifference to their wacky antics and his sandbagging of emotional moments. He'll pitch in, he'll do his share of work, and he'll even protect them so long as it benefits him, but he won't participate in any of the wacky silly bonding moments. And while it is funny, looking at it from a more zoomed out scope gives it a new angle that's actually kind of sad. Sugimoto is a killer, but he's still human. He can still act silly, make jokes, and be childish from time to time. But Ogata is like a cold stone wall. Watching his indifference to the joy around him brings up something people don't usually think about. When talking about psychopaths, people tend to hyper-focus on how dangerous they can be, how awful someone with no empathy can behave to other people. But what about the other side of it? What about the psychopath, who can't relate to anyone? No one tends to think of how lonely it must be to be so utterly separated from everyone else, how tragic it is to not even understand what you're missing. But Ogata does exactly that, which is why I love him so much as a character. He's not sympathetic because he's a good guy who turned bad, or because he has some tragic backstory, or because he thinks he's doing a good thing. Ogata is a bad guy doing bad things for bad reasons, and yet there really was no other way it could have turned out. He's suffering, and he doesn't even realize it. I think it's about time we get into Ogata's backstory. As I said before, Ogata isn't a tragic result of some horrible incident that turned him evil, but he is a fully fleshed out character in this world, which means we can trace where he came from and where it led him. Ogata was born the bastard son of Kojiro Hanazawa and his geisha mistress Tomei Ogata. Kojiro had a prestigious reputation in the military and abandoned Ogata's mother while Ogata was still a baby to return to his wife when they had their own child, Yusaku. Over time, Tomei became more and more deranged. She cooked Kojiro's favorite dish, anglerfish nabe, every single day in hopes that he would come home to her. Young Ogata obviously got sick of this and snuck out with his grandfather's rifle to begin hunting ducks to bring home in hopes that she'd cook anything else. This is a small but important moment. No one ever taught Ogata to hunt. Most of the time, the hardest part of teaching a child to hunt is getting them over the idea of taking the life of a living creature. But Ogata just did it naturally all on his own. He wanted to eat duck, so of course he had to kill them. It was that simple. But no matter how many ducks he killed, his mother never cooked them. She just kept making anglerfish nabe. Eventually, Ogata poisoned his mother, not because he couldn't take it anymore, but as a simple test. 
If his father really cared about her even a little bit, he would show up to her funeral and then she would finally get to be with the one she loved. Okata saw killing his mother as a favor to her, one that ultimately failed because his father never showed. Ogata later joins the 7th Division and meets his younger half-brother, Yusuku. Yusuku is incredibly excited to meet his older brother, while Ogata is more or less just mildly annoyed by him. He brings Yusuku to a brothel to drink and attempts to get Yusuku to sleep with prostitutes. The reason Ogata does this is because Yusuku is a flag bearer, and there's a superstitious expectation for the flag bearer to remain a pure virgin in order for his comrades to remain safe in battle. Ogata wants to ruin Yusuku's reputation, and thereby his father's reputation, by tricking his brother into dishonoring himself, and uses his brother's desire to bond with him to accomplish it. Now, at first this is a simple desire for Ogata. If he can make his legitimate brother and father look worse, it proves he's not so bad as the bastard child and betters his own position in society, as well as getting a bit of revenge on them. But when Yusuku refuses this, it becomes a growing obsession of Ogata's to prove his brother is not morally superior to him, that Yusuku is just faking his goody two-shoes act and is the same as him, the same as everyone else. Yusuku later leads the army against the Russians with nothing but his flag, not even carrying a rifle in the battle and not even drawing his sword. Ogata brings into question his brother's behavior. He can't understand why he would do something so illogical, why he would sacrifice so much of himself for some sense of purity that doesn't exist. He says Yusuku is just using it all as an excuse to not have to get his hands dirty, to avoid having to fight for himself, and demands that he kill a prisoner he captured. Yusuku refuses every attempt from Ogata to manipulate him into ruining his alleged purity, continuing to believe in doing the right thing no matter what. He says that he has to keep himself pure, even if it's just a belief, because it's just the right thing to do. As the flag bearer, it's his duty to remain pure, to inspire people around him, to make them believe in the fight, because everyone feels guilt when killing. Ogata stonewalls him, saying nobody feels that way. No one feels any guilt or remorse over killing. Everybody is like me. I know it. Yusuku cries and hugs him, reassuring him that he's not that kind of person, that there's no one on earth who could possibly kill without feeling guilt. During the Battle of 203 Hill, Ogata shoots his younger brother in the back of the head and kills him. This is the crux of Okata as a character. His refusal of the idea that people feel guilt for killing, that other people aren't like him, that there's something wrong with him. He can't accept that other people feel empathy or remorse for those they kill. He can't accept the idea that he's in the wrong, because there is no right or wrong, just what is and what isn't. There's no terrible tragic moment that happened to Ogata to make him like this. Ogata chose to kill his own mother. Ogata chose to kill his own brother. Ogata chose to kill his own father. He's not justified for a single one of these killings. He's a remorseless killer that has no good reason for the terrible things he's done, yet he's sympathetic. Something inside of him is broken. He's not doing any of this out of malice or hatred, but because it's logical to him. And when he reveals his true self to his brother, the only person who's ever truly supported him, he outright denies it and says, you're not that kind of person. Despite what a good person he is, Yusuku fails Ogata in this moment. He doesn't try to help or support the true Ogata, because he can't even accept the idea of what Ogata really is. A cold-blooded murderer. A psychopath. Ogata feels next to no emotion. He does horrible things for horrible reasons. You don't feel bad for Ogata because something bad happened to him that made him a murderer. You feel bad for Ogata because he is a murderer, and he really didn't have to be. We now have a clear picture of who and what Ogata is. He is a careful, calculating sniper, a merciless killer, and a true psychopath. He takes pride in his skills as a marksman and his correct way of thinking. This is the most interesting part about Ogata, his inability to understand what he's missing. Throughout the series, he struggles with this idea that other people feel this thing called empathy, that they're not just faking it like him to further their own goals. He struggles with the question of what this empathy is, if it even has any meaning, or if those who let it guide them are just fools. It's why he became so obsessed with trying to prove his brother was the same as him, that he had just as much capability to kill and wouldn't actually feel bad about it. And when Yusuku showed he clearly did have something Ogata lacked, he began to wonder why. What is this empathy I'm missing, and why am I missing it? Is it because I was born from parents who don't love each other? Is it because my parents didn't love me? Should I even care that I'm missing this empathy? He comes to the conclusion that he was born like this because his father didn't actually love him or his mother. A child born from parents who don't love each other comes out missing something. He believes that he lacks Yusuku's moral compass because of this. Ogata's pride can't accept the fact that Yusuku had something he lacked, so he convinces himself that it wasn't his fault. He never had a chance to have what Yusuku did, and he begins to resent Yusuku for this. But this is wrong. Kojiro may have been a terrible father who abandoned Ogata and his mother, and maybe he could have steered his son down a better path, but in the end, Ogata is who he is. He killed his mother completely of his own decision, and felt almost nothing from her death. He killed his loving younger brother just to see if Kojiro cared about him at all. When his father doesn't care about him, he's actually satisfied. 
because in his mind, it proves him right. He's glad to learn that deep down, his father truly never cared about him. It reinforces his idea that his lack of empathy is a result of his parents not loving him, that it's natural and there's nothing wrong with him. But this notion is challenged by a sirpa. There's a part in the series where he secretly shoots her father and Sugimoto in the head, though Sugimoto survives unknowingly to him. While they're separated, Ogata travels with a sirpa, trying to earn her trust. As Ogata travels with her, his ideals are challenged more and more as she continues to try to see the good in people, to try and forgive when possible, and most importantly, by her refusal to kill another person, no matter how evil they are. Unlike Yusuku, who refused to fight at all, a sirpa is a skilled hunter and combatant who, despite her ability to kill, still refuses to actually commit the act. Ogata can't write her off as a simple coward like he did with Yusuku, which brings the questions he had about his brother back to the surface. Was my brother really just a coward serving his best interests? Was he really just more fortunate than me? Or was he actually a better person than I am? Is what Yusuku had something I should have wanted for myself? Are these people the standard and I'm actually the aberration? He begins to hallucinate visions of his brother more and more in stressful situations, such as after he has a duel with another sniper where he spends the whole night completely still, eating snow to hide his breath to the point of near frostbite and making himself sick. Ogata resents the idea that his family or his brother are noble, because it brings in the question why he isn't. Seeing this in a sirpa begins to frustrate him, and he even begins to subtly change for the better as he's silently self-reflecting on their journey. Something as small as Ogata, quietly using the Ainu phrases Hina and Chita Top to himself is so meaningful, because for a psychopath like Ogata to be doing something so logically pointless shows that he has the capacity to change and better himself. But unfortunately, it's really too late. Even if his change were far more drastic, he has already killed far too many people, including his own family. He realizes this, that he's done far too much to possibly get away with it, but he's only just now really starting to understand what it means to live, and he's obviously not the kind of person that would turn himself in because it's just the right thing to do. But he is slowly changing, and he wants to keep changing. For perhaps the first time in the series, he shows genuine emotion and even trust in Asirpa, asking her to tell him the secret of the Ainu gold, and we finally learn why he's been after it. He wants to leave this life behind and start over somewhere entirely new, somewhere where he's not held down by ties to his noble bloodline, where he can escape his past and truly become a new person. However, a sirpa finds it suspicious that Ogata waited until they were alone to ask this. While Ogata is almost certainly telling the truth about his goals, that taking all that gold for himself would just cause more problems for him than anything, it doesn't mean everything he's saying is true. If a sirpa had told Ogata the truth to finding the gold, he likely would have killed her right there and then disappeared from the group. With a sirpa gone, there would be no one to stop him from taking what he needed and vanishing. He tries to further manipulate her with half-truths, telling her that Kira Ronke, someone else they're traveling with, was the one who gave the signal for her father and Sugimoto to be shot. What he doesn't tell her is that he's the one who shot them, and that Tsukimoto survived and is coming after him. Okta is very skilled at manipulating people, however he's running out of time and needs to get this information from Asirpa right now because Tsukimoto is closing in on them. This barrage of manipulation and lies just continues on and on. Ogata continues to twist truths around to try and convince Sirpa to tell him the secret to the gold. It's important because it shows us that while he is capable of change, he is still choosing his own interests over being a good person. Even though he's beginning to realize and question his own morality, he still hasn't reached a point where it matters to him more than his own goals. He will still lie to the child whose father he killed to get what he wants, and when she figures out his lies, he's willing to hurt, threaten, and if need be, kill her. A Sirpa draws her bow, and Ogata realizes that he's not going to be able to manipulate his way out of this, so he falls back to his previous goal, proving that there's nothing wrong with him, that everyone is like him, that they're just lying to others and themselves, that there's anything wrong with killing people. He's completely ruined his chances of getting the gold and therefore a second chance at life. Sugimoto is fast approaching and he knows he's very likely going to die, so he challenges Asirpa on her philosophy that killing is wrong. With his own life on the line, he explains that there's no problem killing people you have a reason to kill, that you won't feel any guilt over it. He tells her to kill him, going as far as to tell her the truth, that he killed her father. He's ready to die if it will finally prove that he was right all along, that everyone is the same as him. When she refuses him, he refuses her back, saying, People like you shouldn't exist, as he prepares to kill her. But just in time, Sugimoto shows up. Sugimoto's shout startles up Sirpa, who accidentally lets go of her arrow. Ogata is shot in the eye and smiles, because he has finally managed to ruin the alleged purity that he resents so much. Sirpa's arrows are poisoned, so Sugimoto quickly cuts out Ogata's eye and begins trying to suck the poison out. Despite the fact that he's been trying to track him down for months to kill him, Sugimoto works desperately to save Ogata's life, because he refuses to let Sirpa break her code and become a killer. Sugimoto will gladly kill Ogata himself, but will prioritize protecting Asirpa over his own rage and thirst for vengeance. Sugimoto makes sure to take Ogata to a hospital and get him treated, doing everything he can to make sure that Asirpa is not responsible for his death. 
While there, Ogata manages to escape. While he escapes, for the first time in the series, we see some true, genuine emotion from Ogata. He spreads out his arms as Sugimoto fires at him, laughing and smiling as he awaits the incoming bullets. They miss, and Ogata leaves with a final grin to Sugimoto. In this moment, Ogata has truly and fully lost it all. His entire family is dead, his betrayal of the 7th Division has ruined his military career, and has Lieutenant Surumi after him. His betrayal of Sugimoto and Asirpa has made enemies of their group as well. He truly has nothing, not even a rifle to his name. Yet for the first time, he's truly happy. He's happy because his long life of suffering is over. He no longer has any reason to play nice or fake emotions to appease others. He's lost it all, and in losing it all, he is finally truly free to do absolutely whatever he desires. Despite firing at the fleeing Ogata, Sugimoto is actually pleased with the turn of events. He wants Ogata to leave and make a full recovery. He absolutely hates Ogata and wants him dead more than anything, but he wants Ogata to retreat and come back at full strength so that when he kills him, Asirpa has nothing to do with it. Sugimoto is clearly very different from Ogata because even if he's a killer, he's a good person. But what about someone who isn't a good person? Is Ogata really that different from any other bad guy just because he doesn't feel emotions like rage or greed? We actually see an incredible example of what makes Ogata so unique when he's compared next to Usami, another character who's a complete sociopath. Before we talk about Usami and Ogata, we have to talk for a moment about the leader of the 7th Division, Lieutenant Surumi. Both Usami and Ogata are, or at least were, members of the 7th Division under Lieutenant Surumi, a renegade intelligence officer who is a master manipulator. While Surumi is clearly manipulative, cold, and a merciless killer, he's not a sociopath or psychopath like Usami or Ogata. He clearly not only feels, but understands a wide range of emotions, which is what makes him so effective at manipulating his men into an almost cult-like worship of him. Nearly every man under Lieutenant Surumi's command is abundantly loyal to his every order and would even gladly die for him. Despite this, he has a hard time controlling two in particular, Usami and Ogata. Surumi's manipulation is only mildly effective on Ogata because Ogata feels no real trust or connection towards anybody. You cannot manipulate true loyalty out of someone who has none. Usami, however, is completely under Lieutenant Surumi's spell, perhaps even more so than Surumi once. Even from a young age, Usami was willing to kill his best friend for the mere idea that Surumi viewed him as having more potential than him. When Surumi dared to try and tell Usami's friend that he might have more potential, Usami lost it. Usami was a lowly farm worker from a fairly lower class family, while his friend was from a wealthy family with military importance. He put all his pride in the fact that someone as popular and important as Surumi told him that he was the best in the judo school. So when that was challenged, he lost it and killed his best friend in a fit of rage because he couldn't forgive them. That. Surumi plays it off, saying that he only said that in hopes of making Tomoharu give up and didn't really mean it. Almost instantly, Usami calms down, casually discussing how they should cover up the murder, not even referring to his friend as he, but just it. This is who Usami is. He is a sociopath that will readily kill anyone he dislikes. He is filled with hatred and envy for those more fortunate than him, and places almost all of his self-worth in the fact that someone as important as Lieutenant Surumi cares about him. As long as he is important to Surumi, he can feel like he matters. He places so much importance on this that he will go completely berserk and readily murder anyone who dares to insult Lieutenant Surumi, or even anyone who happens to be getting more attention from him than he is. Surumi says himself that Usami is a natural-born killer someone who truly feels no remorse for killing people, something he shares with Ogata. Yet despite this, the two are nearly polar opposites. Usami clearly feels emotions, not only that, but very extreme ones. He's full of rage, and he enjoys killing immensely, referring to the spot where he first killed as Sacred Grounds. He loves to be praised by Lieutenant Surumi, to the point of getting face tattoos to honor a drawing Surumi did on his moles. Compare that to Ogata, who is indifferent to his killings and keeps calm even when he's defeated. Ogata cares so little about Surumi's opinion of him that he'll readily betray him if it's in his best interests. These differences are made even clearer in their skill sets, which complement their personalities perfectly. Ogata is a sniper. His kills are entirely impersonal. He shoots from a distance before you ever even get to see him. He keeps calm and tracks his target like they were simple prey. Usami is a brawler trained in judo. He likes to get up close and beat his victims to death personally. He has no empathy for others, flies into a rage, and is dangerously unstable. Lieutenant Surumi is the only thing that keeps him a soldier instead of a convict, which is part of why he's so undyingly loyal to him. As long as he follows Lieutenant Surumi, he can do whatever he wants. Surumi's power is his power, and his pride is tied directly to that. Ogata's pride, however, is entirely internal. As long as he knows his own skills as a sniper and tactician, that's enough for him. He only gets tripped up when he begins to question himself. 
He doesn't need society's praise or the status of a soldier. He doesn't care about Lieutenant Surumi's opinion of him. He cares purely for himself and his own goals. Despite their similarities, Usami actually hates Ogata. In the past, they had a very clear-cut conversation where they agree almost entirely on what it means to kill someone, or rather that it's meaningless and has no guilt associated with it. But even Usami, another merciless killer who murders for even worse reasons than Ogata, can't understand him. He can't understand why Ogata doesn't see how great Tsurumi is. He can't understand that Ogata's motivations aren't from some sort of hatred or resentment like his. Usami is filled with hatred for those he kills, while Ogata is filled with nothing at all. Usami can't comprehend this and projects his own feelings onto Ogata, who sees right through what he's doing. Usami accuses Ogata of having some secret hatred for Surumi for making him kill his father, when in reality, Ogata was more than happy to receive the order. Similar to Ogata, Usami thinks that everyone thinks like him, that everyone has the same selfish desires and a lack of empathy towards the pain of others. So when someone he thought was more like him than anyone else ends up being so different, it sends him into a fit of rage. Just like Ogata's frustration with Yusuku and Asirpa, Usami is frustrated by Ogata's nonsensical way of thinking. Why is this person who is supposed to be the same as me making these decisions I can't understand? Why is it working out for him? Why is he succeeding when he's clearly making the wrong choices? This all comes to a climax when the two of them battle and Ogata ultimately comes out the victor because while Usami is obsessed with enjoying his kill and gloating over his opponent, Ogata is interested only in victory. Usami needs everyone to see how superior he is, while Ogata only needs to prove to himself that he's superior. After taking out Usami, Ogata is satisfied. He feels that he's not only proved his way of thinking is superior to the alleged purity of Yusuku and Asirpa, but also even to other like-minded killers like Usami. You don't really feel bad for Usami, because he's fully aware he's doing bad things, but he doesn't care as long as it quells his rage or makes him feel good. You hate his decisions, but you know why he's making them. But watching the machine-like indifference of Ogata brings in the question why he's doing any of this. He just keeps killing, despite the fact that it brings him no joy, despite the fact that it ends up costing him, despite the fact that in the end, it hurts him. Psychopaths have fantastic potential as characters. They throw you off because you can't think like them. They surprise you because they take bold, decisive actions. It's so fun watching a character that has almost a no emotional tells of what they're thinking or what they'll do next. Ogata says very little and barely even makes facial expressions, yet every time he's on screen, both the readers and the characters are terrified of what he might do next. Even when he's saving one of the good guys, they're trying to talk him down from just fucking killing everyone. Something as simple as Ogata taking watch is a fucking nightmare, because while his skills make him the best man for the job, he doesn't spare any time for misunderstandings or hijinks. If you were a pro Problem, you will be promptly solved. There's more to Ogata's story, and it has a fantastic ending, but I don't think spoiling it will really add anything to this video, because I've already covered just about everything that makes Ogata so great. He's a true psychopath. His horrible actions feel completely realistic and logical, while still being something you wish he didn't do. Ogata's objective is as confusing to the reader as it is for the characters in the story, until it finally clicks and you realize that he's not just a no-nonsense soldier, but someone with deep issues that doesn't even realize it. Golden Kamui not only portrays Ogata's psychopathy beautifully, but it even shows how sad life of a psychopath can be, how they're not just monsters beyond help and actually need support just like anyone else. And it does all of this without the sappy over-forgiveness most manga tend to have towards their villains. Satoru Noda understands that we as the audience don't need the characters within the setting to forgive Ogata for us to like him. We don't need him to give a big speech about how he's understood the error of his ways. If you want to see exactly how Golden Kamui ultimately deals with Ogata, you should really watch or read it. It's a great series full of so many characters bursting with personality that you could probably make a video like this on most of the cast. Not only that, but it will also actually teach you a ton of history, including the traditions and cultures of the indigenous peoples of Japan. It's one of the only series I couldn't binge read because literally every chapter hits you with non-stop back-to-back action, comedy, historical information, and character development to the point that trying to read more than one arc at a time is overwhelming. I know this video is pretty different from the last few I put out, and that's kind of on purpose. The Rooftop Swordmaster video and videos like that would easily get way more views. I know that people like to hear a bad series get made fun of more than they'd like to hear a good series get praised. There are tons of terrible series out there I can make videos on, but I'd rather try to promote smaller series that are good and could use support. Granted, Golden Kamui isn't that small of a series, being that it has four full animated seasons, but I still feel like it gets way less attention than it deserves. This video was a lot less, I don't know, excitable than usual, because I felt like this was a kind of serious topic that's important to me. I really do hate how commonly the terms psychopath and sociopath get thrown around to just any character who isn't a good guy. Anyways, yeah, that's it, I guess. Uh, Ogata's an awesome character, Golden Kamui rocks, and psychopaths are fun as fuck when they're written correctly. Peace. <laughs>